Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Narina Hertz to Live Talks Los Angeles, and we welcome back Brian Grazer, whom we hosted for his book, and he also kindly interviewed Bob Iger for us. Both those interviews are in our YouTube channel. We invite you to visit our channel with over 300 conversations. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, where our handle is Live Talks LA. Yeah. Narina's book is The Lonely Century, How to Restore Human Connection in a World That's Pulling Apart. She's a renowned thought leader, academic, and broadcaster. Her previous bestsellers include The Silent Takeover, The Debt Threat, and Eyes Wide Open. And they've been published in more than 20 countries. And her opinion pieces have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Guardian, and the Financial Times. Brian Grazer is an Oscar-winning producer and New York Times bestselling author. His films and television shows has been, have been nominated for 43 Academy Awards and 195 Emmys. I am Ted Haptegaber, founder and producer of the series. I will let you take it from here, Brian. Great, thank you for having me on today and allowing me to interview a friend of mine and someone I deeply, deeply admire. Uh, and I met her initially about seven or eight years ago as a curiosity conversation. And so, I would just ask Narina, what is my most favorite world economist doing today? <laughs> well, <laughs> writing, writing a book about the lonely century. Sure, I mean, that is what I'm doing. From a very lonely London, um, where we are in very, very strict lockdown and not able to see even our, um, even our friends on the street at the moment. So we're all feeling, um, we're all feeling especially lonely and isolated for sure. Well, you started this before COVID, as I remember. Yes. Um, maybe, maybe a year. I don't know. How long before COVID? Actually, about three years before COVID. Oh, so my I, God. Yeah, because what happened was uh, my students, I was teaching at university, and what I realized was more and more students were coming into my office in office hours and telling me that they felt very lonely and isolated. And this was this was the new thing because I'd been teaching at university on and off for well for quite a long time, and uh, and I hadn't seen this body of students expressing how lonely they felt. And there was something else I noticed when I set them group assignments. Quite a few few of them were struggling with in person face to face interaction, and. I actually raised that with a colleague, somebody who runs one of the US's most prestigious universities. And he said, we're seeing exactly the same thing here. In fact, it's so bad here that we're having to run how to read a face in real life classes <laughs> for our students because they're so used to being on their screens and on their phones that literally we're having to teach them you know, if you're in a meeting and somebody smiles, that means it's going well. And if they frown, that means it's going badly. And I thought, this is really interesting. And that was one of the kind of jumping off points for why I started doing this research. Well, okay, so let me ask you this. Um, how, I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> One is how were you able, like, what caused you to detach from what you're currently doing in your very busy business life to say, I'm gonna dedicate myself to writing a book about this particular yeah. subject. What was, what was the sort of tipping point for you personally? And then how did that, um, how did it begin? So I'd had this, observation about my students and that was and that was that was an unexpected occurrence because I hadn't really thought about loneliness in the context of young people you often think about loneliness in the context of the elderly and that was something that people had been discussing for a while I hadn't really thought about it and it wasn't being discussed amongst the young and um, yeah. there was some there were a couple of other things that happened at roughly the same time in my academic research, I was getting increasingly interested in the rise of right-wing populism. So the rise of Donald Trump in the United States, but also in Europe, the rise of Salvini, Le Pen, Alternative for Deutschland in Germany. And I wanted to better understand the drivers. And I started interviewing right-wing populist voters across the globe. And one thing that came across time and time again from their story from their stories was how lonely they felt. 
uh, how lonely in two senses, lonely in the sense of feeling that they lacked friends and the support network. And in fact, there's research that shows that Trump voters, for example, were significantly more likely than Hillary Clinton voters in 2016 to say that they didn't have friends or even acquaintances and the only person they relied on was themselves. So lonely in that sense of lacking friends, um, but also lonely in the sense of feeling disconnected from their employers, from their political leaders, from the state, feeling invisible, unseen. Because for me, loneliness isn't just about feeling um, that you're craving company and companionship, and friendship, it's also about feeling invisible, unseen and uncared for, whether by those around you or by the state. So my research, um, you know, in a, my kind of interest in the rise of right wing populism and trying to figure it out made me realize that there was an emotional driver playing a really significant role. And that was loneliness. And then the third reason, and there also there were three very different things happening at roughly the same time. The third reason was that I had bought an Alexa. <laughs> Have you got one? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I had noticed that I had, I was becoming increasingly attached to my Alexa. And I would just sometimes, you know, say, hey, um, I'm not even going to use her name in case you, everyone's devices now go off, but uh -huh. hey, you know, um, tell me a joke or hey, how are you? And I found myself um, doing that. And it got me thinking about what I came to call the loneliness economy. So a whole market for goods and services and products um, designed really to help us feel less lonely, more connected, and at their best deliver community. So I was thinking about loneliness in the context of my students. I was thinking about loneliness in the context of right-wing populist voters. And I was thinking about loneliness in the context of these goods and services being designed to alleviate loneliness. And all of those together made me think there's something going on here. Like we have built a lonely world and it is having consequences. It's having, it's affecting our health. It's affecting our wealth. It's affecting who we vote for. And I thought I really want to dig into this more. And that's why I spent, a few years really immersed in this subject, um, you know, self-isolating way before every, the rest of the world joined me. Right, got it. Well, it's, it's fascinating. Do you, um, what are you, what is the biggest problem with human, what, what is um, the consequence to human beings in being lonely? Hmm. So, <laughs> I mean, so, it's, it's in some ways rhetorical, but since you've researched this so yeah. so actively with such intensity, I just thought there might be a human and scientific response to that. Yes, for sure. Okay. So essentially, we are creatures of togetherness. We are hardwired to connect. And being feeling alone is not our natural state. And so what this means is that in evolutionary, um, we've, all, we've been designed so that being lonely is a particularly uncomfortable state of being. So when we're lonely, it's not just that we feel more anxious and more depressed. We do, we are more likely to feel anxious, more likely to feel depressed. Unfortunately, there's also a link between loneliness and suicide rates. And in Japan, for example, just in the last few weeks, we've seen these rising levels of suicide, especially amongst Japanese women, which you know is during this period of enforced isolation and loneliness. So, but also um, what happens when we're lonely is our bodies go into fight or flight mode. So our heart rate goes up our levels of cortisol, our stress levels in our body go up, our blood pressure goes up, all of these kind of signals telling our body, don't be lonely, go and find other people, go and find your tribe, go and find people to hunt and gather with. And we don't do that in contemporary life. 
So we remain in this state of loneliness for protracted periods. And that's really, really bad for us physically because you know, being in that state of fight or flight, red alert um, is bad for us. I mean, as bad in fact as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Right, yes. Worse than, well, worse I, just than thought of, I just thought of this, uh, su- this, uh, this selective uh, supporting data to your thesis is that my friend who I've made seven movies with Tom Hanks always said man's greatest fear is loneliness and that's why he made the movie Castaway is to like is to explore it in you know in a cinematic form uh, and but he was oh he always said that and he's a very of course very brave and accomplished person but he this is his single Uh, you know, the single differentiating idea that he would always bring up. And there's actually evidence to um, that really supports that that came out during the pandemic in Germany. uh, There was research done with the people manning uh, helplines when the pandemic started. And what the people manning the helplines reported was that more people were phoning up worried about loneliness and being lonely in this period of isolation, then we're worried actually about catching the coronavirus. Oh my God, yeah. that's really something. Yeah. That is really something. And, and maybe, I mean, I mean, probably love is one of the most powerful forces the, in the world, right? Or that exists, I don't, I mean, this isn't the absolute theory of your thesis of your book, but but I think we all, as a species, want love. We look for love to ground our lives and to, and to, to create further, greater meaning. But do you, how would you expand, expound upon that? I think we crave to be cared for. I think we crave yes. to be seen. Safety. I think we crave to be heard. And increasing numbers of people over the past few decades, don't feel seen, don't feel heard, don't feel cared for. Um, I think love is of course the ultimate, um, the ultimate gift, Um, but you can feel lonely. Um, That isn't the only solution. I mean, I think you can, you will, you will do, you will do well if you can just be seen, heard, feel seen, heard and cared for and feel yeah. and feel connected. I mean, love, I guess, is about feeling connected and um, at its best. And yeah, and people are feeling disconnected. And I think the scale of this, this is what really was so shocking that even before the pandemic, one in five Americans felt lonely often or always one in five and one in five millennials didn't have a single friend. Oh my God. That is so amazing. And that's really where I was going to go with this with so many kids that are going to read this book and be affected by it. In fact, I have it right here, which I love the book. I read it in in galley form, but so basically the social media, the variety of social media that's interactive, that doesn't, that's not a solution. No, if anything, it's a negative. And, you know, I began my research, I was really agnostic, Brian, on the role that social media played. I didn't go in with a kind of preconceived idea, but having spent a few years looking at this in depth and having interviewed many teenagers and young people, I feel very sure that social media is playing net a really negative role when it comes to loneliness. I mean, we had a sense that this was going on from empirical data. So we knew from that we saw a real explosion and rising um, levels of loneliness in young people in adolescence from about 2010, which really was around the same time that we saw a rise in smartphone usage amongst this generation. So there was always a sense that the two might be connected. but it could have been just coincidental. It was, it was hard to uh, establish it scientifically, definitively until about a year and a half ago when there was a very big study done at Stanford University where 1500 people, students were told to use Facebook like usual. 
the other 1500 were told to actually stop using Facebook for two months. And then the researchers looked at what happened, how the um, people who stopped differed from the control group. And what they found was that the people who stopped using Facebook spent significantly more time doing things in person with their friends and family. Because one thing that, come, that came across from my research time and time again was the relative paucity of virtual interactions. Um, I know nowadays that's kind of pretty much all we've got and we're all grateful for having something. It's better than nothing, but I think we also are really missing that face-to-face -face being in a room for good reason. Um, but the other thing the researchers found was that the group who went off Facebook were significantly happier and also significantly less lonely. So going off Facebook made you less lonely and happier. In fact, the researchers found that staying off Facebook for two months was about 40% as good as going to have therapy. Huh. Oh. <laughs> um, I know. So, and then there've been similar studies done with other social media platforms since. But when I interviewed young people, I think it came, you know, it became very clear to me why this should be so. Um, yep. I think partly it's just how addictive these platforms are designed to be. And I mean, I know that I'm, you know, once, once you start using them, they are addictive and I can feel myself reaching out to my phone if I've been posting things to check, has anyone retweeted, has anyone liked? Um, so, you know, and they're designed to give us that dopamine hit when we get a retweet or a like. So partly that is because they're so addictive and why that matters is they basically distract us and detach us from our in-person face-to-face relationships. So, you know, we're in a room with our partner, our family, and um, we're on our phone and we're not really looking at them or seeing them or hearing them. And that feels more lonely. Um, there was research even done where just a smartphone was put on the table between a couple. And um, the researchers found that even when the smartphone was turned off, and even when neither of the couple were touching the smartphone, the couple felt less connected to each other and less empathetic towards each other. So it's partly the addiction and it's partly because of the fact that when you're scrolling on your feeds, it's easy to think that everyone else is more popular than you, that everyone has more friends, that everyone has a better social life, that in relative terms, you're lonely. And for kids, of course, this, is, this can be particularly poignant. You know, scrolling on their feeds, seeing their, supposed friends out there without them, being excluded from groups, being excluded from WhatsApp groups. And, um, and that's you know, painful at any age, but for the young, that's really painful. And your social, their social status, their sense of being very caught up with the um, ratings that they're being given on these sites. So this kind of commoditized self um, is, an alienating self um, and, and one that can feel very lonely. And then of course, there's the toxicity on these platforms, the bullying. 65% of British students have been cyber bullied. Um, over half of women aged between- 60%? 65. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, and over half of 18 to 24 year old women, this is a UK study, have experienced abuse on Facebook. I mean, so, you know, and of course, experiencing this hatred, vitriol, abuse, bullying is going to make you feel more lonely. So a whole host of reasons why social media is clearly playing a big part of why this is the lonely century. I mean, it's not the only reason, but it's clearly a really significant reason. Yeah. I mean, like it's so everything you're saying is so relatable and it's it's rather it's beautiful that it's supported by actual facts, which you've done tremendous amount of research and been exhaustive with your time in doing this. And I can just I, I find look, I'm, as you said, find myself slightly addicted to going to Instagram and other social media as well. But everybody's so happy, like. The world is, nobody is that happy all of the time. 
<laughs> so you go to Instagram, it's almost like the rule to be on, the gateway to be on Instagram is you have to be happy. Um, yeah. I mean, nobody, you have, nobody. To be, you have to be on a big boat or a private jet, or you have to be on all, all doing all these things. Often they're just welded together, you know, it's, but what's your thought? Yeah, I mean, nobody puts on Instagram, do they, or on Facebook. Um, I stayed in by myself watching friends eating nobody. packets of Mrs. Field cookies. I mean, <laughs> nobody does that. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and the danger of that, of course, and especially if you're like a younger person kind of with an evolving self, yeah. is that, you know, who who is being liked when you're putting this um photoshopped, um, filtered <laughs> image of yourself out there. Who is being like you, the real you, or this fake you? There was one teenager, actually, an LA teenager. That is such a good point, Marina. It's such a good point because they're all constructing it to some degree, these Instagrams. So who I hadn't thought of that. It's a very deep realm that you're in, entering, like who is being liked. So that's another reason to create depression. Yes. Or loneliness. Yes. Yeah, and there was some um, one teenager, actually, an LA teenager, um, who said to me, talked about, um, she said, you know, for my generation, it's as if we're living our lives like avatars on an online video game. Yeah. So you have this kind of persona, but which you feel detached from. And yes. yeah, so it's... So you've done a tremendous amount of research and there's a lot of different sort of your observational case studies uh, from Japan to robots flipping burgers. Can you give us the sort of full range of that aperture, please? Yes, so um, so I went around the world and uh, had experiences, uh, met lonely people, um, saw some of the products that are alleviating loneliness. And um, one thing I did was when I was in New York, I rented a friend. <laughs> You're kidding, <laughs> how, how do, you, do you rent a friend? So I had heard that you could rent a friend. Um, I found a website where, which actually has over 600,000 friends to choose from. Um, and I rented Brittany and okay. I met her. I was a bit worried, Brian, before I met her. I have to, I have to admit, you know, I did think, what am I letting myself in for? Is yeah. this something? Who is this Brittany person, yeah. right? is this untoward but um no i met her downtown manhattan um at chacha matcha we drank matcha tea together we wandered around mcnally's one of my favorite bookstores um looking at books we went to urban outfitters we tried on hats and sunglasses it was kind of like obviously it wasn't like being with an old friend but it was you know when you meet a new friend or someone new and you really click with them and it feels really fun on and you have this kind of buzz going well that's how it felt with Brittany I mean of course it did because of course she was like laughing at all my jokes <laughs> she's making me, she's making me all of a sudden you became the funniest person in the world right yeah I only realized only afterwards that's the thing it's very easy it's the stories we tell ourselves so it was um, it was very easy to kind of you know delude myself in the moment and and um but then we're standing in Urban Outfitters and she turns around and she goes, time's up, that'll be $120, please. <laughs> so, oh so um, but yeah, she was so, you know, Brit, but I said to her, who rents you? Who are the people who are renting you? Oh, yeah. And uh, she said, interestingly, she said, mainly 30 to 40 year old professionals, uh, women as well as men, people who've moved to New York, working in finance, in consulting, in tech, come to the city don't have friends don't have support networks and want someone to go to the movies with or go for a walk in the park with or or go to a um even take to a party with so that so that so that it looks like they have a friend and um yeah so i found that quite moving in a way and 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 you know and what's it telling us about the world we've created that people are having to buy friends um but in Japan, of course, it's not where where actually rent a friend started. So this whole idea of renting a friend started in Japan, but they have gone now much more down the technological solutions to loneliness. And they um, 
for quite a few years, we've seen an upsurge there of social robots. So robot friends and robot carers. And even in nursing homes in Japan, there are even, um, I saw um, elderly women knitting bonnets for their robot carers because they'd become so attached to them, um, which is, <laughs> it's quite, you know, it makes you, it feels quite like something from a movie, but, um, but then when I think about how attached I became to my Alexa, or if you think about how attached people are to their Roombas, you know, those like vac vacuum cleaners, those round robot vacuum cleaners, yeah, yeah. I mean, people get really attached to them. It turns out two thirds of people have conversations with them and one in 10 people um, give them a name and make costumes for them. I love the idea of making a costume for your Roomba. Um, but, you know, so we can... Really guess, happens. People actually do do yeah, that. It's easy to... Yeah, it's far easier than we might expect to become attached to an inanimate object. And, um, yeah, so social robots I saw. I Robots, I got quite into robots with my book in general, and I got I really started thinking about the role that robots will play as our friends as our um, companions, also as our co-workers. Actually in Pasadena, I met Flippy, who's the world's first burger um, flipping robot chef. Oh and God. he works in a fast food joint. And I mean, of course, if you could hire lots of Flippies, why would you, you want humans? I mean, Flippy always knew which spatula to use. He never mixed up the raw meat one with the um, cooked meat one, never asks for a holiday, um, never takes time off sick. Never complains, never shares anything real. No. And how lonely will it be if your co-worker's a robot? And how lonely will it be when you have lost your job, of course, to a robot, which is something which increasing numbers of people are going to face in the coming years, um, for sure. So what, is there just... And we'll come back to this, the center divider on this, but um, is there a, an antidote to that, a solution to for the people that are losing their jobs to automated AI devices? So um, I think I think there are a number of things that we could do and should do uh, on this front. One idea is to impose what we might think of as a robot tax. Um, so this would be essentially a tax on employers um, oh. per robot. So because employers at the moment, it's in their advantage to have a robot, not only because they're efficient, but also they don't have to pay all the taxes that they would normally have to pay for a flesh and blood employee. So governments could at least level the playing field so that it wasn't such an, an advantage. Um, and that's something- Very which, good idea, to accept yeah, idea. Yeah, I think, so I think, and actually South Korea is now doing that. And that's a country, so, you know, and that's a country that's very pro-robot, so pro-robotic. So it's not a kind of Luddite anti-progress position. It's a way of thinking, how do we deal with the social consequences here? So that's one thing I think that we can do. But I think, um, you know, because not only do we know that loneliness and unemployment are linked, so everyone can be lonely, rich, poor, high income, low income, employed, unemployed, but we know that some groups are lonelier, low income, unemployed, young and women. Um, but we also know that, auto that areas of automation um, are actually the areas which have seen the, uh, which had the greatest percentage of people voting for right-wing populists. So again, it links to the political situation. Um, because, you know, jobs, when you lose your job, you also lose the brotherhood that comes with a job. You lose the status that comes with your job. So again, it's thinking about the um, takeover of employment by AI. And we're talking, you know, we're talking that as much as 40% of jobs it's estimated, will be lost to AI within the next decade. I mean, that is 40% yeah. of jobs. And of course, we're not talking about that right now because all the focus is on the pandemic. And yet that's the next ticking time bomb. 
with big societal consequences for sure. So yes, definitely things we can do on that front. In your, um, what communities or populations are more happy versus less happy? Okay. Or unhappy, unhappy versus happy. Yeah, so um, in terms of kind of feeling more connected to each other and less lonely, there are definitely some communities that stood out. Okay. Uh, often communities of faith. So communities where um, where people felt bonded um, oh. in religious terms. And actually one group who I looked at was the Haredim. So these are the ultra-religious Jews in Israel. You know, the ones who wear the black hats, of the course. men, yes. women in the modest clothing. Also so, Fairfax in Los Angeles. <laughs> oh, what was that? Do you have the- Fairfax <laughs> district in Los yeah. Angeles. Yeah, there's- yeah, but go ahead, please. Yes, I've been to. Yes, yeah. like the ones in the Fairfax district in Los Angeles. So oh. this is a group who, by all kind of traditional measures of what you would expect in terms of health and life expectancy, they should score really badly because they don't eat very healthy food. They eat a lot of fried food, a lot of kind of sugary food. This is not a group of people who exercise particularly. This is a group of people who have higher than level, higher levels of obesity than average. They have lower levels of vitamin D, even the ones living in Israel, because they're wearing all their, all their bodies so covered, they're not getting exposure to vitamin D. So for a whole host of kind of objective measurements, we would expect this group to um, feel um, less, to be less um, healthy than other groups. Yeah. And, and, therefore, um, and therefore maybe less happy, but that- And therefore, and, and also, yes, and also exactly, and also therefore less happy. But in fact, on both counts, this group does significantly better. Um, they feel less lonely. Um, and it's not just about, I was interested to understand with these faith groups who feel less lonely, was it because um, because they feel close to God. Is, is that the reason? And I, and, oh. and it, you know, it may, I think it plays part of the role, but researchers have found that it's, um, so looking at kind of people who, um, in Catholics, um, sure. they found that Catholics who go to mass feel significantly less lonely. It was the act of going to mass, of being amongst other people, of being part of the community that um, religions often provide that was alleviating people's loneliness. And the same with the Haradim, they just, they do a lot with other people. They celebrate bar mitzvahs and festivals and Friday night dinners. And they're there for each other in a very tangible way in times of crisis um, when things are bad. So um, when you feel that people, we're back to those same themes. When you feel that people care for you, when you feel that you're supported, when you feel that you're seen, well, then you're likely to feel happier. And it turns out healthier as well. The Haradim live longer than the average Israeli, which goes against everything you would have thought given what they eat, yeah. given um, their exercise, given their vitamin D deficiency. So I found that really fascinating. And again, it spoke to, um, how important feeling connected to others are for our mental health and for our physical health. Yes, that, I mean, I didn't know that, but it's really, if you visualize what you just said, which I did, it's a profound finding that they would be more healthy and that they'd be more happy rather, and they'd feel less a sense of loneliness. Actually, it sort of seems like Today, this moment, our uh, tech founders are the new gods. <laughs> and, I, <hope> and <laughs> I said that like sort of quite very facetiously, but but if if you I think and I, you speak to this um, in our previous century, there were spiritual leaders and mm -hmm. uh, ones that we could identify. Even Martin Luther King was it in a way a spiritual leader. 
Gandhi was a spiritual leader. We could go through that list of spiritual leaders and that causes people to believe in something other than themselves, something bigger than themselves. Uh, in the same way you're identifying faith in Israel. Yes. Um, so and unfortunately we are going in the way that your findings are directing us to, you know, the being more lonely because of where our world is going. Yes, and it's and it's and it's partly yes that we don't feel um, less people are religious, less people are going to church, less people are going to yeah. synagogues. So it is partly that. We're, but but more generally, we're doing less with other people. So we eat less with others. We are more likely to live on our own. We're less likely to be a member of a trade union. We're less likely to be a member of a parent-teacher association. So all of the trends really for the past few decades have been towards um, a more atomized existence. And at the same time, we've become as a society more individualistic. So we really see this from the 1980s. You even see this in pop song lyrics. So yeah. you look, I love this study of pop song lyrics where they examined um, uh, words in, in pop songs and what they found was that from the 1980s onwards what we've seen is, is a steady diminishment of collective um, words so um, words like we, us, our and these have been replaced instead by I, me, myself so you know in the 70s it was we are the champions and oh, now it's um, Kanye no, yeah. you're, you're, you're so right. I mean, your book is really, I mean, I loved reading it. Others should read it because it's really was prescient of you because it was again, pre COVID and. Uh, yes. And of course, COVID's just accelerated and exacerbated it. And, exactly. it, and the most recent data in the U S is 50% of people feel lonely often or always currently now in the U S. And as you know, uh, tech or some tech companies announced they're not they're not going to go back to their offices for a year, even if yeah. they're able to. Correct? I know. I think that's I think that's a real mistake because you know, I think for many people, for most people, and I've been really tracking this over the past few months, that initial euphoria about working from home and remote working has yeah. worn off, and. Yeah. Most people are actually missing the office, missing being around other people, missing yeah. um, those water cooler conversations. And, and there is a real temptation, I think, for many companies to think, well, this is a great opportunity now to slash overhead, um, reduce our physical footprint. Why needs an office? Everyone, you know, everyone's managing. But I think people are you know, a lot of people are not managing and we're seeing real rising levels of mental health problems. It's hard to feel connected to your fellow employees when you don't see them. It's not great for creativity no. or innovation. I mean, you know, I don't know what you're finding, but, you know, the research I've, I've, been, I've been seeing is, you know, we're all doing the best we can, but it's yeah. not as good as being in the room with other people. And actually there's a whole host of research to make very clear that loneliness is really bad for business. Lonely employees are less motivated, less productive, less engaged, more likely to quit than employees who aren't. So, you know, in setting up remote work as the new normal, I think businesses are in danger of, in, um, of encountering some significant costs that they maybe haven't anticipated. Not that the workplace was, you know, I don't want to romanticize the workplace pre-COVID because even before COVID, the workplace for many people was actually a lonely place. 40% um, you know, of American office workers said that they were lonely at work before the pandemic. And, um, you know, and there's a lot that employers need to do on that front and can do on that front. Um, you know, often, Brian, it's really simple things that can make a huge difference here. One of the um, things, and this again was something that came out time and time again in my research, the role that eating together 
can play in alleviating loneliness. Yeah. And there was research done in America with firefighters. And the researchers wanted to understand why certain companies of firefighters performed so much better than others. And what they found was that one of the single biggest determinants was whether they ate together. And companies of firefighters who ate together performed on average twice as well as companies who didn't and felt much closer to each other. And the two, of course, are linked. And if you feel more bonded to your colleague, you're going to work better with them. So, you know, we can, so once we are back in the office, and I, I hope we are back in the office when we can be, you know, maybe it won't be exactly the same as the past. And maybe, you know, there will be a bit more, flexibility built into the week so that we won't have to be in the office every single day maybe but um but I hope you know eating together employees taking breaks at the same time that can make a huge difference as well so actually quite small things can make a really big difference in the workplace you know because I spent the first 20 years of my career only writing and producing comedies humor makes people happy, gives them joy. You don't have humor really when you're, certainly you don't have it when you're alone. You don't have it when you're not with a group, when you're, and you, we can all notice there's a lot less laughter on these Zooms. You just, because you can't read people's bodies. You can't read the nuance. You can't, you know, the, the physiognomy, all those things are gone. And quite frankly, that's, that's a lot of the stuff that informs the ability to have humor. You're absolutely right. That's a great observation. And um, yeah, I mean, it's also really hard. You know, I'm sure we've all been doing these meetings where there's a lot of people on a Zoom. So like these big yeah. Zoom meetings. Yeah. I mean, it's impossible to, you, know, you never, that's so true. You never see anyone, you never have laughter. Never laughter. We, we, are, <laughs> we on these Zooms, can actually assimilate a lot of information and knowledge. We can actually produce and assimilate a lot of data, but none of it's funny. <laughs> and uh, it can't, humor cannot be underestimated in terms of human connection. You're so right. You're absolutely right. I, I think that's a, that's a really great point. And, um, and we know that, you know, and there's increasing research now coming out on it as well, that you know, when we're on Zoom, there's so many factors. We, we don't see the body language. We are drawn to our own image. So in a kind of narcissistic way, we're drawn to our own <laughs> image rather than. Um, That's true. And, it's it's funny. That's true. and it's also exhausting, like just looking at people kind of in the eyes the whole time. In a real room, you wouldn't. You'd be looking around, you'd be looking at your papers. But on Zoom, you feel like you have to be like this the whole time. And that's and, but there's something else that, which I found fascinating um, that goes on with our brains in real life when we're in a room that isn't replicated on Zoom. So in a real face-to-face -face interaction, what happens is um, not only do we subconsciously mimic the person we're talking to. So if, they're, yeah. if you're smiling, I will kind of subconsciously smile. So we mirror yeah. subconsciously, but our brain waves actually synchronize. And that's why we feel empathy because um, actually our brains are synchronizing. And when we're on Zoom, when we're interacting on Zoom, our brains find that hard, much harder to do, that synchronicity because of the latency, because there's a lag, because um, we're not exactly in real time sync. Um, and that's part of the reason that, you know, when you come away from a Zoom interaction, you never feel you, it's impossible to feel as connected as you would face to face. Yeah. And I know that we're, we're kind of winding down on time for a moment, but and, and I can't anticipate where we are, where we're at. Oh, five minutes. Well, perfect. What is, people have to read this book and follow your message. Um, what is the call to action? What are the things that there's a variety of things that are called to action? What, what, what do you recommend? So, um, so there's my book's got lots of ideas of what governments can and should do. Um, you know, just to single out a couple on that front. You know, one, I do think social media companies are the tobacco 
companies of the 21st century and I do think they should be regulated as such especially when it comes to children you know who are really becoming overly addicted to these platforms at the least I think addictive social media for children should be banned and the onus should then be on social media companies to come up with products which are not so addictive. Um, I think the other key thing governments could do is reinvest in the infrastructure of community public parks public libraries daycare centers youth clubs community centers all of these since 2008 have seen a massive diminishment of public funding in the united states public libraries have seen their funding slashed by 40 percent since 2008. Oh. people need to have physical spaces to be yeah. together if we are not only to feel not if we are not only to feel more connected but also if we are to be able to come together again as a society and reconnect um and i think also the government needs to put money right now into alleviating just how acute loneliness is amongst us when over 50 percent of the population are feeling lonely the whole time right now this is a real public health problem and in the united kingdom in um, the Netherlands, in Norway, um, we're actually seeing governments invest, governments actually making, uh, putting aside budget right now to address loneliness. So hopefully it's something we'll see happen in the US as well. Um, but this isn't just about governments. Businesses have a lot that they can do. And again, kind of lots in my book about what they can do, but essentially they should be driven by the principles of showing our employees that we care for them, um, helping our employees feel seen and heard and actually engineering ways for their employees to come together. So I think those are the principles, um, the key principles that should drive that. And then finally, there's a lot that we can and should do because um, you know, this isn't just a top, this isn't just a top down situation. There's a lot that we can do to come together again and reconnect we can try putting down our phones more and be more present with those who are physically around us. So I actually try and put my phone, like have a basket and put my phone there in the evening um, so that it's not in arm's reach because when it's in arm's reach, it's too much of a temptation. Uh, so that's something to try and do. Um, second, we can, and I think this is really important right now, we need to think about how we can support and help our local stores and our local cafes, um, our local um, studios, because we need places where we can be with others. We need to nurture our local neighborhoods. And these businesses are really struggling right now, as we all know. So what can we do to help them? Because actually, even those micro connections we have in our local bookstore, that chat we have, with our bookseller, the chat we have with a server in our local cafe, these really help us. Even a 30 second exchange helps us feel more connected to those around us um, and happier. The fourth thing we can do is we can um, actually actively think about, is there a way that we can actively help others? Like, is there some sort of service we can do? Um, because actually when you help others, that makes you less lonely. Um, and it's a real win-win. You're helping others and you're helping yourself. And on an even more micro level, just think, is there anyone in your own network who might be feeling lonely? And if there is, you know, just even just send them a text, <laughs> pick up the phone. If you can go, I suggest you go and meet them for a safe, socially distanced way. If you're somewhere where you can do that, do that. Because right now we are being tested like we've never been tested before. And just showing someone that you're thinking about them, that you see them, that you care about them can make a huge difference to how they feel. I so agree. And I, I love the book. I love the book. I It's going to be hugely popular and uh, it's important and everything you just said from the big scale to the granular of the things you can do, I'm gonna do many of them because 
they'll make me feel good. <laughs> so it's been a privilege talking to you today, uh, Marina, and go get this book. <laughs> Brian, thank you so much. Thank you. And Ted, thank you for having me on as well. You bet. Uh, it was a pleasure hosting you. And uh, thanks, Marina. Thanks, Brian, for returning to our stage or our screen, as it were. A reminder again, Marina's book is The Lonely Century, How to Restore Human Connection in a world that is pulling apart. And it is available wherever books are sold. Thank you. <laughs>